I said, please, no. We don't need another Liberia. <laughs> A sick nation where black Americans and Caribbeans went and say that they're going to civilize that heathen brother. We don't need no condescending attitude towards Africans abroad and Africans in Africa. If we return to Africa, we will return and walk the same street with the Africans, <laughs> go to the same school, fight the same battles, and cry over the same defeat. No separation between African people and African people any place in the world. It's not needed. And if you think you're going to have a separate state in the United States, you're dreaming because no white people are going to move aside and give you no state. You, you can have a multiplicity of miniature states. Your community, you can make your community into a miniature state. And there are places in the rural south where most of the county is black. You can gain control of that county, gain control of these small cities. Now, there are places where we can have a high degree of sovereignty, where we can practice for the kind of skills that we will take out to Africa. But the whole separate state concept is impractical. We have to stop dissipating so much energy on impractical projects pare ourselves down to what is realizable. Now, before going back to the question, can we be an African people again, let's define what an African people are, what they are, and let's define what happened to the Africanness of African people. And let's look at to what extent are we still an African people and don't seem to know it. Living in rural Alabama, in Georgia, and traveling in Africa, I've seen identical traits, I've seen cultural manifestations, no different from one place than the other. And if you tell the black American he's doing something African, he won't hit you. And yet, through genetic transference, he still maintains so much that is Africa. What sustained Africa those many years before the foreigner? What did he create within himself that he had a society where he not only had no jail, but no word in his vocabulary that meant jail? He created a system where man's function was to bring people in harmony with nature. There are some aspects of it that may work for them. But our concept of consensus in talking that the African, the European called Palava, uh, African Parliament, Proceed. We need to look at that again. What can we draw from that? We need to look at our families again. And I need to look at my own family and when there was debates and my great-grandmother was alive and finally she would listen to the debates and then she would render an opinion based on it. If there was any dispute, all she had to do was to stand up and tap her cane on the floor, which means the court is over, the decision is in, no further conversation. She had said the wisest thing, she'd given it all kind of thought, she said that listen patient to everybody's argument, to analyze the argument and reach the decision. And that was our Supreme Court. And she was nearly always right. She was one of the great loves of my life because anytime anybody wanted to punish me,
she would say, send the boy to me. And I start laughing inside. 108 years old, how hard can she hit? <laughs> Felt more like hugging to me. <laughs> the whipping was of short duration, but the lecture would last the rest of the evening. <laughs> she would tell me the story. I think we have grown too much away from each other and we have not listened uh, to each other. We have not consulted farm that we created. I don't know who Robert is, who did it, Robert's Rules of Order. And he, if he's alive, and I hope I got enough sense to choke him when I find him. <laughs> he spoiled more meetings. Point of order, Mr. Chandler. Point of information, Mr. Chandler. I always hold holding up <laughs> where you can listen to consensus, the whole meeting will be over in a little while. Because the, the, the best thinkers among you will arrive at a consensus based on what's on the floor. And you'd have the best opinion you're going to get. All right, now, how did we lose being an African people in as much as in spite of foreigners, we continue to be an African people all over the world until about the end of the 19th century. Outside of Africa, the most African place in the New World was the Caribbean islands and parts of Brazil. <coughs> How is it that 50 years later, they become black English, black French, black Spaniard, black Dutch, and forgot about it. When they had brought off some of the most successful slave revolts in history, based on the cohesiveness of their Africanness. How do we get it back? We can get it back by looking at what kind of success we had when we communicated one to the other. We should examine very critically what other people are saying about us. We should examine very critical the people who said that they are our friends when they are the people trying to take a community away from us. There are too many things happening in this city that we have not examined. We should examine the concept of planned shrinkage, a plan to drive the poor out of New York and make it the bedroom for the middle class. They don't want poor whites in the, in the city either. Poor whites won't even be able to pay the rent. Now, if a man makes sandwiches in a lunch and air, and he's good at it, why shouldn't he have a decent home? Why must he be some kind of an executive to get a decent place to stay? Now, in an African setting, where the king was in charge of the distribution of goods and services, he would get a place commensurate with his needs, irrespective of his ability to pay. This was a form of socialism. And they did not call it socialism. They didn't call it anything. They just lived it out. And what did the Europeans do? Formulize it and dogmatize it and came back to sell you what you had in a much better form before you know they existed. And that's what is still happening. That's what's happening in our court. That's what's happening in relationship to the disintegration of our community. That's what's happening with the control of image. That's what's happening with the bad movies being made. That's what's happening with um, 
Spike Lee's misconception of the black college and the black uh, college president is happening because we are not controlling the image and we are not controlling the curricula. In New Orleans, speaking with two college presidents on the subject of the future of the predominantly black colleges, I said, I cannot speak on the future of the predominantly co black colleges because I don't know one predominantly black college. Right. Because I don't know one, I will address myself to what would a black college look like if it did come into being, if it dared to be black. What kind of curricula would it have? It would have what the students at Howard University were demanding, an Afrocentric curricula. It's a contradiction in terms for students at Howard to demand an Afrocentric curricula at a black school because at a black school, that's the only kind of curricula you should have. Right. At Brandeis and Yeshiva, you've got a Jewish-oriented curriculum. They don't apologize for having it. They said, this is what it is. Now, they didn't say, don't come here. But they said, if you come here, this is the curriculum. We're not going to change it to suit you. Black schools should be good enough to train any student of any race and any religion in the country and still have a curricula that predominantly favors black people all over the world. If you go to Harvard, Harvard was found as a Protestant school to train the future rulers of the United States. It's not going to change its curricula for anyone. It's going to remain. One of the Blyden brothers went to Harvard and is going to get a degree in political science. And they seem to remind him every day that Ralph Bunch was the last person who got a degree in political science and that certain things are expected of you if you get a degree in political science at Harvard. And so they set him down his committee and he thought that because three of the members of the committee was his personal friends that he had it made. So they asked him, who is your political hero? He said, Parnell. This man don't talk nonsense. Parnell, an Irish patriarch who blew a revolution chasing after some English, English woman. That we will not give you a PhD at Harvard if your hero failed in his mission. He must succeed in his mission even he had to step over his mother he have to politically succeed in his mission. And so he thought about it and took some time off. He came back, wrote the PhD thesis in 45 days, and asked, who's your hero? He said, Cromwell, this is good. <laughs> Cromwell chopped off a few heads <laughs> here and there kill the king, but he succeeded. He held England together and <laughs> to spill a little blood here and there, but he didn't fail. He wanted business in England, so the Jews had been expelled from England. He brought them back. Now this was a lesson, is that Harvard is set up to train people who spoke a point and whose hero worshiping must be focused on people who succeeded no matter how.
and not dreamers. 